All right. Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be in God's house and to be here with you all after the past two weeks I've been out. Um, thank you all for dealing with Brother Jeff while I was gone. I know that's a headache. I was supposed to be a joke. I'm <laughs> Brother Jeff, will you open us up in the world of prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, dear God, it is good to be in your house this morning, dear Lord. I pray that you just be with our services, uh, be with us, the praise band, dear God, as we uh, lead worship this morning. And I pray that you be with Brother Davis. He brings your word to us this morning, dear God. Dear Lord, I pray for the ones who aren't here this morning for whatever reason, just keep your hands upon them and on us, dear Lord, as we worship. All we, th- we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and begin our praise this morning. We're just over in the glory land. If I was you, that's good. Yeah. Well, but, uh, they all know we do we appreciate you, Jeff. Jeff for filling in, but it is good to have Zach back up here with us today. I don't know. You read into that what you want to. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to have everybody here. Uh, I do want to remind you of a few things. Uh, first thing I want to remind you of uh, September 12th. Now, if you've seen the slide rolling through, uh, we're going to have a disaster relief breakfast here that morning. Um, and what that's going to be is if you've got some questions about disaster relief ministry or if you've got a place where you would like to be involved, sign up on the association website. That's crbn.org. Uh, you can find it under disaster relief. But you need to sign up because the reason is they need to know how much food to, pre- to prepare. 
So if you plan on coming, we would love to have you, but if you pop in at 9 and you didn't sign up, you may get to smell the biscuits and gravy instead of partake of the biscuits and gravy. But uh, please consider coming, even if you don't sign up for a team, at least to find out what we've got going on and how uh, our churches are involved in this ministry. But anyway, that's going to be Saturday morning of September 12th, so mark that on your calendar. Uh, another Saturday, October 10th, we're having a work day out at Wolf Creek. This is a big work day. Uh, we got, I can't even remember what our number of churches is now that we've combined with the Delta Association, but everybody, that's kind of going to be the meeting point that Saturday morning, and we're going to just try and knock a lot of things out that are on our, our punch list so that we can be ready moving forward for next year. And so just uh, put that on your calendar as well. That will start early. It's 8 o'clock that we will start there, which means you got to leave here by like 7.30. Some of you are like, it is a Saturday morning, and you're telling me i got to be up and out of the house by 7.30? Okay, look, the only thing I ask, brush your teeth. I don't care if you comb your hair. I don't care if there's makeup. You say, but we're wearing masks. I don't care if we're wearing masks. Brush your teeth. That's the only thing you got to do to get ready for that day. And so you don't have any excuse for not being able to get up early. Just do that, and then we can meet out there. Like I said, that's October 10th out at Wolf Creek. Um, many of you know that we had started trying to put together a, a new church directory, and then COVID jumped in and changed all those plans twice. Uh, we were supposed to have had it done, pictures taken in May, and then we're like, well, we're not really going to be around so we postponed it to September and so I called him back and said I'm still not sure that September is going to work for us because we still got a lot of people that are out so we've got new dates again maybe third time will be the charm but we are now going to be looking at February 9th and 10th to have our picture made and you say well why do you tell me that this early okay men you're off the hook because y'all haven't been the one in my ear ladies I have given you plenty of time. Some of you say, well, you got to give me time to prepare. If we can't be ready by February, I don't know what to tell you. So just know that February 9th and 10th is the two days that we're scheduled to have pictures made. As we get closer, I'll give you some more information about signing up for your time slot to come get your picture made with your family. But that's what we're looking at. So please pray that this works out because I'm really tired of rescheduling this. Um, but I think this will be something that's good for us. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a directory made, and so this will be a good way to uh, not just get everybody's picture made, but for me, learn people that maybe I haven't met yet. So anyway, be in prayer for that as well. All right, one more thing, and I saved this one for last, even though it's the one that's coming up the soonest. Tonight, we're having an, the All-American Back to School Prayer Rally. Man, that is a mouthful. I got to tell Jeff, we got to work on shortening some of these down. But anyway, tonight we're having a prayer rally. It is a drive-in, drive-through prayer rally, so you do not have to get out of your vehicle. Uh, what it's going to be at 7 o'clock tonight, we'll meet at Second Baptist Church. As you're pulling in, you'll see signs to tell you what station to tune your radio to. And when you do that, magically, the program will come through your car speakers, and you'll be able to hear everything that's going on. Uh, we've got just a little bit of live music that we're going to have tonight and just some uh, directions. And then we're going to turn you loose, and you'll pull up a video, and it will guide you through all the campuses here and how to pray for the campuses as school starts back tomorrow. So uh, please make every effort to be there tonight. Like I said, 7 o'clock tonight, Second Baptist Church, uh, as we go and we uh, pray over our schools getting ready for this coming school year. All right. Was well, there anything else before we move on with our service? You're like, no, we've had enough announcements. Let's just move on and get the show on the road. Deal. So let's put a smile on our face, sing loud, and uh, just worship the Lord like he's due. Amen. All right. <laughs> just to clear a few things up, I love this man right here. He is my <laughs> brother in Christ. Amen. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> He's done a great job filling in for me, and I tell him that literally every day how good of a job he does, don't I, Jeff? That's right. I sure do. But I already do that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, brother. <laughs> All right. Let's sing I Love to Tell the Story.
by your constant grace, held within your perfect peace. Never once, no, we never walked alone. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful. Breathing at your grace Forevermore We'll be breathing out your praise You are faithful, God You are faithful, you are You are faithful, God You are faithful, you are You are faithful, God You are faithful ask you all to stand for this last song. Jeff and I had done this a couple weeks ago, and it really rings true for me today because I'm so thankful to be back in the Father's house. Amen. your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore ooh you're in the Father's house sometimes on this journey I get lost my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over Cause my story's just begun Still you want to find me That's what my father does Yes, still you want to find me Cause that's what my father does Lay your burdens down, ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failures never find a way, the father's in the room. No failures never find a way, the father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burden. shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore ooh you're in the Father's house ooh in the Father's house the prodigals come home the helpless find hope on the move when the Father's in the room. If the prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical finds faith. And love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds 
somebody here this morning that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, dear God, I, I pray that they come to know you this morning in this service, dear Lord. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. jump in to our sermon this morning. If you got your Bible with you today, we're going to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 16. Now, while you're flipping there, I want you to just kind of entertain me for a second. I want you to name some mythical creatures that maybe you've heard about, you've seen on TV, you've heard stories about over the course of your life. So just, just shout them out. It's okay. Thanks, dog. <coughs> Somebody's still hot. Dragons, fairies, leprechauns. Ooh, those are kind of scary. Unless they're the ones that bring you that delicious cereal. Those are okay. Now, <clears throat> over the course of our life, we've heard stories about things like Bigfoot. Any of y'all heard about Bigfoot? Am I the only one? Okay. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, you know, this big ape-like creature who wanders through the woods. Which, by the way, yesterday we went wandering through the woods, and I didn't see one single sign of Bigfoot. Maybe some snakes and some hogs, but no signs of Bigfoot. But Bigfoot's one of the most popular myths that we hear. Sasquatch. Uh, what about Nessie? Anybody know who Nessie is? The Loch Ness Monster. Now, as a kid, Scotland was one of those places I would have loved to have gone, and I still would like to go. And if I go... I'm going to Loch Ness, and guess who I'm looking for? I'm, I'm looking for Nessie. But the odds are long that I will see Nessie, because more than likely, Nessie is not real. She's just a myth. Um, when we go to Disney, we go to Animal Kingdom, and one of our favorite rides is Expedition Everest. Anybody ever ridden the ride? You get to the part of the roller coaster where you start going backwards, and something is supposed to jump out at you. Anybody know what it was? The Yeti. Now, the Yeti's been kind of broken, so it kind of diminishes the ride a little bit. But the Yeti's another one of these mythical creatures, an abominable snowman. It's supposed to live in the, the mountains in the Himalayas, and who knows what it does or how it gets there. But it's one of these mythical creatures that has been talked about over and over again for generations. Now, kids, there's a little more kid-friendly one. What about a unicorn? Now, some of you are like, yeah. I asked mom and daddy for one for my birthday, and I still haven't got it. Well, maybe next year. Now, it's another one of these creatures that we hear a lot about. We see it, pictures of it, but more than likely, it's just not real. And when we, but when we hear tales about these mythical creatures, whether it's Bigfoot or the Yeti or Nessie or the a unicorn, it elicits all kinds of a range of emotions from us. Sometimes... It invokes fear in us. I mean, I'm going to be really honest. If I did see signs of Bigfoot in the forest, I might come up with a new hobby because I just don't know that that's going to be for me. But then other 
end of that spectrum. Maybe when you think of unicorns, it puts a smile on your face and you're happy and you just get the warm fuzzies all over. When we think about these creatures, it elicits a wide range of emotions from us. But in the end, we know these creatures aren't real. And because they're not real, they're really not something that we're overly concerned with. We don't spend a lot of our day contemplating well, is Bigfoot real? Am I going to run into him today? Is mom and dad really going to get me that unicorn this year? Since we don't believe that they're real, we don't spend an overly large amount of time thinking about them. But folks, here's where I'm going with all this. Tragically, that's how most people view the existence of hell as well. They view the existence of hell just like we would Bigfoot or Nessie or the Yeti, or a unicorn. Oh, we hear it talked about. We hear it, people tell stories about it, but we're really not that concerned with it. So we just kind of shove it aside. Folks, that is so sad. We might have some concept of what hell is supposed to be like. We have heard people tell us stories about it since we were little kids. But in the end, a lot of people have decided that it's not real. Therefore, they're just not overly concerned with it. I told you last week that I like statistics because it helps me think concretely about some pretty abstract problems. I was looking up uh, some statistics this week, and one of them that I came across was in 1996, they did a survey of our entire country. Now, I don't know what the exact sample size was, but it was not just Christians, but all Americans. And they asked them a question, said, do you believe in a real hell? Anybody want to take a guess of what percentage came back? Yes, I believe in a real hell. Again, this is 1996. Close. 71% in 1996 said, yes, regardless of my religious background, regardless of what, how I was raised, yes, I believe in a real hell. 2016, 20 years later, they did the survey again. Ask the same question. Do you believe in a real hell? Anybody want to take a guess what the number is? 58%. 58%. In 20 years, it dropped 13 percentage points. And folks, I dare say I believe that trend is going to continue. Again, this isn't just church people. This is at large. And folks, it is tragic when we think that, that there is a sizable portion of our population that goes, no, hell's just as real as Bigfoot. Hell is just as real as the unicorn or the Yeti. And they just dismiss it out of hand the same way. And folks, that is a tragic way of thinking, regardless of who says it, regardless of who thinks it. But it's even more so when it's we as believers who think that way. You say, oh, but I don't know a believer who would think that way. Folks, I was shocked at what I found. Here's what I start hearing more and more often these days. Oh, a loving God would not send anybody to hell. Now, we're going to take a quick time out because this is a soapbox moment and it's a different sermon altogether, but I'm just going to tell you something. A loving God doesn't send anybody to hell. A loving God made a way to escape hell. Hell is what we deserved. A loving God made a way out. Anyway, that's another sermon for another day. But that's what I hear more and more often these days. A loving God wouldn't do this. You know what we found out? One out of every four professing Christians says there is no such thing as a real eternal hell. Let that sink in because we go, oh, well, that's not too bad. One out of every four Christians you see, there is no real eternal hell. And you may say, well, preacher, why is that a big deal? I mean, I'm saved. I've got my ticket punched. I'm good. Folks, here's the thing. If we don't believe that there's a real eternal hell, why are we motivated to keep people from going there? Last week, we started talking about engaging 
again. Re-engaging with our population, re-engaging with our society so that we can rediscover an urgency to reach the lost. And folks, one of the obstacles that we see is that if we don't believe in the reality and the eternity of hell, why would I ever have a sense of urgency and go and tell somebody how they can escape it? Folks, that's where we find ourselves. We like to talk about heaven and our reward. We like to focus on the good things that we're going to get. But did you know that while Jesus was here, he talked more about hell than he did heaven? You don't believe me? Look it up. Go scouring through the Gospels and see how often he talks about hell. Jesus made it very clear while he was here to his disciples and to us who would come after them that hell is an awful place where everyone who does not accept his grace gift is going to spend all eternity. Folks, I'm just going to tell us like it is. It is highly irresponsible for us to go, I got heaven, I'm good. It's an abuse of the grace that God has given us to take that attitude. Jesus wanted us to know clearly that there was, in fact, a real eternal hell that had real eternal consequences and so he talked about it this morning we're going to look at a story where jesus talks about just this thing a real eternal hell and how it plays out so if you would look in luke 16 we're going to pick up in verse 19 it says there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came out and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham! Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have brought five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, folks, in this passage, we see a man who's like many people in our world today. We see a man who's like many people in our churches today. A man who failed to take the reality of hell seriously. That's not because there was a lack of teaching. We see here that he responds to... Abraham, and he calls him what? Father Abraham. So we know this man is a a good, upright Jew. And there is no shortage of teaching that he would have come up with. The Old Testament is full of teaching on God's wrath, on God's judgment, and the reality of hell. This man would have been exposed to all of them. So it wasn't for a lack of teaching that this man didn't take hell seriously. But we know that he didn't. Look at verse 27 and 28. What is he wanting Abraham to do? Oh, Abraham, send Lazarus back to my five brothers and do what? Warn them. Well, hello. You've grown up hearing about it your whole life. Hello. You've been told about it your whole life. But it wasn't ever part of his life. It wasn't something he took seriously until he experienced it. Folks, I believe that is where a lot of us fall. We won't deny that maybe there is a hell. We won't deny that that's where somebody is going to go. But we fail to connect the dots and see the impact that it will have on eternity. And what Jesus is pointing out in this story 
that there's a difference between knowing about hell and being convinced that it will have an impact for all eternity. If we're honest, that's where a lot of us find ourselves. We've heard about hell, but we've chosen to ignore the impact it'll have. So this morning, I want to do something that may be kind of unconventional. It's really not that uplifting. But folks, if we are ever going to take hell seriously, I think we've got to get a glimpse of what it's going to be like. And so this morning, that's what we're going to do. We're going to just take a glimpse and see what hell will be like. Because I'm hoping that when we catch that glimpse, it sparks an urgency in us that cannot be quenched. So what's hell like? One of the first things I want us to see is that hell is a place of eternal punishment. Look at verse 23 again. It says, In hell, where the rich man is in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony. Do you catch this here? This isn't a place that is a vacation spot. This isn't something that the, the rich man would have picked for himself. Here's a man who during his life had everything he could have ever wanted. He lived a life of ease and of luxury. And now then... It's all stripped away. And not only does he not have anything, but what's it tell us in descriptive terms? He's in torment. He's in agony. Folks, hell is a place of eternal punishment. Jesus backs this up when he speaks in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. He says, and these will go away, these who have not responded to the gospel. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Eternal punishment. I'll be the first to tell you, my daughter doesn't get in serious trouble all that often. Um, I haven't had to give her a spanking in a long time, which is good because that hurts daddy deeply. But I want you to think back, parents, to the time where you were the one being punished. Wasn't that fun? All those days, those were not the good old days. But when you were being punished, and can you imagine at the very worst that punishment ever got, if it was just that bad, but it lasted forever, that would be bad enough. But it tells us that hell is far worse, and the punishment really does last for all eternity. Jesus said it himself. It is a place of eternal punishment. See, here's the thing. Hell is reserved for those who did not accept God's gift of grace, God's gift of salvation. That's why it's there that his judgment will be finally unleashed. You see, everybody talks about a loving God wouldn't do this, a loving God wouldn't do that. But a righteous God says, I can't put up with sin. And the fact that he is a loving God, he made a way around my sin. He made a way to cover my sin. But there will come a day where he has to deal once and for all definitively with sin. And that will happen in hell for all eternity where his judgment is unleashed. And it's going to be unleashed in a couple different ways. There will be physical suffering. There will be mental anguish. Physical suffering, Jesus talks about this part of hell a lot. In Matthew 8, 12, we see that it is a place of utter darkness where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, doesn't that sound fun? That sounds like a place you want to go to, doesn't it? No, of course not. But Jesus says that's what hell's going to be like. In Matthew 13, verses 40 through 42, he describes hell as a fiery furnace. And again, we see there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's awful. In Mark 9, 43 through 45, he carries this out. And it's not just that it's a fiery furnace, but it's a fire that will never be quenched. It will last forever and ever and ever. Folks, the eternal punishment, part of it will be physical suffering. 
not just for a day, not just for a week, but for all eternity, there will be physical suffering. But there will also be mental anguish. In Romans 14, 11, we see a famous passage where we're told that on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And as Christians, we go, yes, Lord, come quickly. But I want you to think about the flip side. As Christians, we welcome that day. But on that day, all who have not professed Jesus as their Lord and Savior... Their eternity is sealed. For all eternity, they will be in hell. And can you just imagine the regret of knowing you blew it? Knowing that you had every opportunity, that you had a chance, and you blew it. And knowing that it's too late now. Folks, we all have regrets. We all have things that we wish we could do differently, that if we had a do-over, we'd take it. Can you imagine for all eternity replaying in your mind the chance that you had to respond to Jesus and you didn't take it? That's mental anguish. Folks, hell is going to be a place of eternal punishment. There is no comfort in hell. There's nothing that's going to be easy in hell. It's eternal punishment. There's another thing I want us to see about the reality of hell. That is, hell is going to be absent of all good. Now, when we look around, we see the evidence of sin all around us right now, don't we? I mean, we don't have to look very far. Uh, Just this week, I've read stories about abortions. I've read stories about human trafficking. I've read stories about families in neglect. I've read stories about houses that are being broken up. All, everywhere we look, we see evidence of sin around us. It doesn't take us looking very hard to find it. But folks, here, even in the middle of all of this other stuff, this junk that is going on, we see God's hand at work. Think about it. We see God's redemptive purposes playing out regularly before our eyes. We see homes put back together. We see lives change. We see wrongs righted. But folks, there will be a day when all of that will cease. God will no longer intervene. In hell, God will completely turn man over to his evil desires. You think it's bad now? Wait until God says, I'm done. That's hell. When God says, I'm done. I've done all that I can do. Have your way. And man discovers just how depraved and corrupt we can really be. Folks, that's hell. Hell will be absent of all good. There will be no inkling of God's goodness anywhere to be found. He will no longer intervene on man's behalf. Instead, all that is left is our complete and utter depravity. I want you to just think for a second. We've all lived through some pretty rough situations. Now I want you to just imagine if God had said, I'm removing myself from this. I'm not going to step in. I'm not going to do anything on your behalf. I'm not going to do anything that could change this for the better. That's horrible. I mean, that just sends chills up my spine just to think how bad it could be. Folks, that's hell. That's going to be hell where God will not intervene. And sin will run rampant. There's another thing I want us to see about hell. And that is, hell is a place of utter loneliness. I'm going to tell you one of my pet peeves. I hear people talking about hell, and sometimes they'll say something similar to this. Yeah, well, I may be going to hell, but at least I'll have my friends there. I won't be going alone. Folks, it drives me crazy and it breaks my heart. 
Because, folks, I'm going to tell you, hell is not some great reunion. It is not some big party waiting to happen. Nothing could be farther from the truth. See, since hell will be devoid of all good, its residents will find themselves constantly at odds with one another. Folks, the only reason that we can somewhat get along with one another right now because God's goodness is still working inside of us. One day, that will be gone. And when God removes His goodness from the equation, I don't care what people think they're going to encounter in hell, how much it's going to be great to have their friends around them, it won't. Because all relationships will be severed. Not one single relationship will survive. Friend against friend, brother against brother, husband against wife. Folks, there's nothing that's going to survive. And so it will be a place of utter loneliness for all eternity. Which is sad, but it also tells you just how bad hell is going to be. Because if you think back, why were we created? To live in a relationship. It is ingrained in us. It is a part of us that we strive for, we long for. And we many times have tried to fill that whole, that relationship in a lot of different ways. But there's only one that satisfies. And to know that for all eternity, that hole will go unsatisfied. And there's nothing that you can try to fill it with. Hell is a place of utter and complete loneliness. There's one more thing I want us to look at this morning. All of these things are true of hell. But there's one in particular that I want us to close with. Look at verse 26. And Abraham tells the rich man, Between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Folks, the last thing I want us to see about hell is that it is a a place of complete separation from God. We see in this passage, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, that there's a great chasm that exists between heaven and hell. But what's it tell us? You can't cross back and forth. But here's the thing that makes it so awful. It appears that the rich man was painfully aware of all that was going on in heaven there was no way for him to enjoy them folks I wholeheartedly believe that this is the worst part of hell I wholeheartedly believe that this is why hell is so awful that for all eternity the residents of hell will get to see heaven in all of its wonders only to realize that they'll always never be able to experience it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the pain and the frustration of seeing something so vividly only to realize that you'll never be able to experience it? You may see loved ones on the other side. Loved ones that you hoped you would see, you thought you would see, but now then they're on one side and you're on the other. And you're forever separated. You see the unadulterated joy that is going on on people's faces as they worship their Savior in heaven, knowing that you made a different decision. You see the laughter and the happiness that is going on as you live in agony and torment, knowing that there is nothing that will ever change it. Folks, hell is a place of complete separation from God. Folks, hell is a real place. Scripture tells us clearly on a number of occasions that there's two options. We either accept Jesus and his sacrifice for us as an atoning cover for our sin 
Or we attempt to do it another way. And we spend eternity in hell. Folks, when we're reminded of just how real and how awful hell is, it's sobering. As I look around the room this morning, there's not a lot of smiling faces. And I knew that would be the case. And folks, honestly, it ought to be the case. Because when we think about the reality of hell, when we think about the awfulness of hell, it ought to be a sobering reminder to us of what's waiting. Yes, we ought to celebrate that I got to escape hell, that Jesus made it possible for me to escape hell. But it ought to also push me to think about other people. What's their eternal destination? What's it going to look like for them? The person that I run into at Walmart this afternoon, what's eternity look like for them? The person that I'm going to encounter at work tomorrow, what does eternity look like for them? And do I have any urgency about me to do anything about it? Folks, as we think about the reality of hell, when we think of how awful it is, it ought to fill us with that sense of urgency to keep others from going there. If we want to engage our society once again, if we really want to see the lost come to know the Lord, folks, I think one of the things we've got to do is Remember the reality of an eternal hell. Because I believe that when we remember that, we say, I don't care what lengths I've got to go to. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what people say or what they do. I just don't want anybody to go to that place. Folks, this morning, will we find a sense of urgency to go to the lost? And keep them from a real and eternal hell. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. and Lord, it's a pretty somber mood in here right now. Lord, as we think about... Lord, as we think about the reality of hell... We, we have mixed emotions... There's a part of us that is celebrating and glad that we don't ever have to experience that because we know that we're covered by your blood. Father, I know that there's been far too many times in my life that that celebration, as worthy as it is, Lord, has blinded me to the fact that my job isn't done. Lord, it's blinded me to the fact that there is a lost and dying world who's not going to heaven with me right now. Well, that if you came back right this second, God, that'd spend all eternity in hell. So, Father, right now, I pray that as we go into this time of response, that, God, you would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would break our hearts. And, God, we'd no longer be content to just celebrate our own gains. Lord, we'll be motivated with an urgency that cannot be put out to reach the nations for you. So, Father, speak to us right now. Lord, speak directly to our hearts. Lord, give us the courage to respond to you. Lord, we love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing?
in the room who say, yes, I, I know that Jesus is my Savior. Yes, I know that He has covered my sins with His blood and I have eternity in heaven. As we celebrate that, that His wounds have paid my ransom, let's be motivated to make sure that's somebody else's story as well. Let's make sure that we take every opportunity we have to tell others about what He's done in us. Let's regain that sense of urgency. All right, was well, there anything else before we're dismissed today? All right, well, I'm going to ask uh, David Knight, will you dismiss us this morning? Father, go with us, go with us, Logan. Arise.
travel's not the end game. The journey's where you are. You never want it perfect. You just want it my